G'day there. What is up? Um, welcome to Pints with Aquinas. Episode, let's just have a look here. I want to make sure I get this right. This is pretty ridiculous. 121. That's insanity. Ah, episode 121. Today I am joined around the bar table by my good mate, Dan Matson to discuss the homosexual problem in the priesthood. So, you know, we got to address this. Dan Matson is an awesome dude, one of my favorite people. He wrote the book, Why I Don't Call Myself Gay. And he just wrote a book, for a book, an article for First Things called Why Men Like Me Should Not Be Priests. He's an awesome dude, I tell you that. He's getting a lot of love, but a lot, a lot of hate from people who are misunderstanding him and who just hate church teaching, let's be honest. Um, all sorts of crazy stuff is ensuing in the church right now, and I want you to know that um, we're, we're going to begin addressing this on Pines with Aquinas, uh, at least over the next week. It's not going to be something that we're going to do ongoing, hopefully, but I have set up some interviews with the following people. Are you ready? Maybe you've heard of them. Raymond Arroyo from EWTN. <laughs> uh, Matt Walsh from... I don't know why I've decided to start hitting that cup. The Daily Wire. Uh, I'm going to be chatting, hopefully, with Patrick Coffin from The Patrick Coffin Show, as well as Sam Guzman from Catholic Gentleman, just to discuss all this craziness that's taking place in the church. Oh, I should probably point out, too, that I'm back on the internet. Hi, what's up? Some of you know I took a month off the internet, which lasted 24 days exactly. So, yes, I did end up caving in and running back to the internet. Um, anyway, that's a story for another day. Uh, but, yeah, just to kind of be honest with you about that, I said I'd be off for a month. I was off for 24 days. And then someone hacked pintswithaquinas.com, had to deal with that. And then I was at church and the priest told us about the sex abuse scandal and read a letter from the bishop and I literally had no idea what was going on. I <laughs> looked at my wife and went, what? And she was like, oh, right, you're not online. And anyway, we'll save that story for another day. Um, I don't know about you, but I have not prayed for another pope the way I have prayed for our current pope. We need to be praying for him. And we need to be demanding transparency and investigations into these claims that have recently come forth. Um, anyway, we get into all this stuff in the interview. So I'm going to shut up and uh, ask you to enjoy it. Enjoy it. See, that was me asking you. Here we go. <laughs> Dan Matson, how are you? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's good to chat with you again, Matt. Uh, how are you? I'm doing I'm doing really well. So I went to confession recently because I drank too much. Uh, <laughs> Maya culpa. I actually don't I don't say that in a in a you know in a in a funny way. I'm you know I'm actually repentant of it. And the priest oh, said good. the priest said something to me. He said uh, two drinks for a gentleman, three drinks for a pig. And so I thought, well, bloody hell, all right, that's a pretty good... Uh, <laughs> right. And so I've decided, well, that's, that's all I'm going to do, you know, no more than two drinks. So I want you to know that I have saved my drink, even though it's late at night here, just for you. So I'm drinking some bullet bourbon here. Well, I, I appreciate you, your, your virtue uh, uh, being demonstrated by waiting until you can share it with someone. Because that's one of the keys, isn't it? Drinking should be a social experience. Yeah. For the most part. G.K. Chesterton, what did he say? He said, We thank God for bourbon and or a beer in Burgundy, and I would say bourbon. Yeah. By drinking not uh, not drinking too much of them, right? Right. Amen. Yeah. What are you drinking? I am drinking a fantastic uh, IPA from Bell's Brewery. I'm in Michigan. This is in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where this came from. Two Hearted Ale. Uh, it's ah. named after a short story by Ernest Hemingway nice. about, about the Two-Hearted River in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so I'm drinking a little bit of hometown beer. I like and it. It's a fantastic beer. It's been named a few times the best IPA in the world. And it's, you know, an hour away from where I live. That's cool. I, you know, one of my dreams is to sit with you in a pub and have a beer. Well, that's a dream of mine. Matt. I'm not just but saying that, dude. I would love. We need to get into a nice, good Irish kind of pub, no TVs. You, me, your beautiful brother, who's an amazing priest. 
Yes, he is. He's a good man, and he likes he likes a good IPA or oh, he likes be. a good good Guinness. We should do it in Ireland. Well, God knows we need a drink tonight because um, we are recording this on the twenty seventh of, of August, and uh, quite literally, all hell seems to have broken loose, or at least come to light within the Catholic Church. Why don't you give us your um, you know impressions on on what's been happening over the last couple of months? Well, it, it, it really is a, a painful season in the church, but I think it's uh, – somebody, somebody said that we're, we're entering one of the darkest points in, in the church's history. I saw that on social media. I said, no, no, I think, I think the storm clouds are starting to break and we're starting to see the light. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, this, there is a, a severe mercy in, in these uh, revelations that, you know, the Holy Spirit – He's the one who's who's ultimately in charge of the church. Think about Pope John the Twenty Third. He said uh, he was praying. You know, everybody knows, knows the story. He said, "I'm going to bed. It's your church, right?" Yeah. And the the Holy Spirit is is the one who purifies us, and I think he has orchestrated things so that the truth is coming out. So it's painful, but I think it's the pain. We need to look at this as the pain of a surgeon's knife. What did you think of, how do you pronounce it, v- Vagano? Vagano. V- you met Vagano recently, didn't you? I, I met him. I was in uh, uh, Milan for the release of the my Italian, the Italian translation of my book. Uh, I was there earlier. Congratulations, this- by the way. That's fantastic. Well, Glory to God. Yeah. yeah, it was very exciting. I, I had a fantastic trip to Italy. Cardinal Mueller introduced my book in Rome. It was very, very humbling. I met Cardinal Seurat and... Cardinal Burke, but um, Archbishop Vagano just happened to come to my presentation. He wasn't even a part of it, and he was there, and uh, uh, I was able to meet him. He was always very supportive of the Courage Apostle, which I'm a part of, that uh, maybe the listeners there don't know about it. It's uh, the official ministry of the church to men and women with same-sex attraction, and uh, he came to my presentation and was very gracious and supportive of it, and so I... I, uh, I, I'm stunned by what he wrote, but uh, people that I really admire, uh, like Bishop Olmsted uh, from Phoenix and, and others, are saying this is a man who loves the church, right. and his testimony is, is trustworthy, and we need to take it seriously and investigate it. Of course, don't take it all. Uh, we need to investigate it, but let's take these accusations seriously. And, and so I, I'm— and for those, for, for those who haven't read it, of course, it was an 11-page, what he called, testimony in which he implicates many high-ranking cardinals and uh, the Holy Father and uh, in, in this whole sex abuse cover-up and in the homosexual problem in the Catholic Church, which we'll talk about, and calls for their resignation. I mean, it was – someone said it was like an atomic bomb went off in the Roman Curia. Yeah, I, I I think it's it's pretty much unprecedented in in modern times. People have talked about uh, you know the Borgia popes and things like that. And I am by talking about that, I'm not equating the Roman Curia right now to Bor- the Borgias. But th- this is unprecedented, and uh, I, I think we're be- seeing the history of the church uh, being written right now. And th- these are, these are shocking times, but. Uh, I think it's it's reflective of the seriousness of the scandals that have uh, befallen us. These are horrific times, and we need some clarity. We can't take accusations without investigating them, but a man of Archbishop Vagano's esteem and uh, his position in the Curia, he he was in a position to know about these things, and so I, we need have to investigate them. Right, yeah. And then the responses of those who tried to discredit him don't seem to me to hold much water. Um, this is a very intricate letter. He, you know, dates and names, um, and it, you know, he's a retired archbishop. You know, he, as he said, he's an old man who's going to soon meet his maker and wanted to clear his conscience before Almighty God. So, I hope that everybody out there listening to this will go for themselves and read this document. What's going to happen since you're a prophet? <laughs> well, I I really somebody put put uh, up on on social media. I saw that Mary is weeping, and I said, no, Mary is sweeping. 
Mary Ooh. is clean in the church, and and it, it's significant in my mind that is she, I, uh, please God she will. Please, I, I I share your hope, and yet I haven't seen one bishop come forward and say, "Mea culpa, I messed up. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prayer and penance." Well, and, and you know, this is this is uh, we can pray for that uh, awareness of uh, of. It sure would be nice to hear some sorrow from. Uh, Right, not just Archbishop cliches. McCarrick. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, for goodness sake, any word of sorrow from him would be good. Well, and, and the fact of the matter is we have to also remember this, that, that the mercy of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cover the sins of Archbishop McCarrick. And he right now is saying to Theodore McCarrick, come to me. And, right, and, amen. And I can give you forgiveness. But you have to, what, what are we told in the confession? We have to have sorrow for our sins. We have to recognize that we've sinned. Right, or else there will not be a big enough millstone. Yeah. You know, to yeah. be around his neck and to drag him to hell for all eternity. But I agree with you because there is this sense within all of us that justice needs to be, you know, handed out. And uh, there can even be this temptation to say, well, they'll get theirs and I hope they rot in hell and these sorts of things. I think that's an understandable emotional reaction. But we have to check that with the truths we espouse as Christians, just like you said, Dan that as atrocious as these men have been and maybe are, the atrocities these people are committing, you know, we need to pray for their salvation. And uh, that salvation Absolutely. won't come about without their repentance, of course. But I, I, If the listeners want to see a, a really beautiful response to uh, uh, the sins of unchastity by, by someone who has made a vow of, of uh, celibacy, St. Basil the Great wrote a beautiful letter to a fallen virgin. This is a woman who had dedicated her life to consecrated virginity, but she had fallen into temptation. Now, of course, not the same level and degree sure. at all, but but the letter is very clear about the sinful nature of what she did. How did you forget your birthright and your mm. dignity? But the end of it, it says, but there is still time. Go run to Jesus. He is waiting for you with open arms. Because who he himself said it, if their sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. So it, it, there, there is this precedent in the church. There's a history of, of people who have fallen in their vows made before God and on the sake of the church. Yes, there needs to be just pun in, pun in, uh, punishment and penance, but the mercy of Christ is always there. At this point in the interview, I tell Dan to stop that ridiculous bloody beeping that's happening in the back of his room. So, Dan, let me ask you, since, you know, for those listeners, I mean, I mentioned this in the intro, you know, you, uh, I'm always nervous when I talk to someone with same-sex attraction that I'm going to butcher how I say yeah. this and that they're going to be super offended. You have and have had, for as long as you remember, same-sex attraction and have been in homosexual relationships, Yes. That's true. I, right. I am. I am. Uh, I've written about it in my book. Why I don't call myself gay? And uh, it's a story is told in Desire for the Everlasting Hills. I never wanted anybody to know about it, but <laughs> there, God you, there you off, go. Except God often <laughs> asks us to do other things. Oh, that, that actually, that's funny that you say that because, you know, we, we often joke that we have similar careers. I wrote that book on pornography about the same time you wrote yours on homosexuality, right? Right. Well, there's this interesting thing. It, it's actually, there's an audio book of the porn myth, okay? Oh, wow. And, uh, but they didn't want me to read it. They didn't like me. I said, hey, I could read it. And they went, Let, let's hear your voice. And I gave them a sample. And they went, yeah, nah, we're going to get this English bloke. I went, nah, no worries. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but what's funny is when you go to Audible and click, like, sample, you hear an excerpt from the foreword from this severe sex addict dude. And oh, it, my. So you just assume that it's Matt Frad's story, you know? I'm like, ah! Now, I was certainly into porn, but this guy was into deviant stuff. So anyway, that gets to your point about not necessarily wanting the world to know this, but hey, right. alas. <laughs> now, and then you just wrote an article for First Things. What was the title? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually uh, about this homosexual clergy issue, why men like me should not be priests. Now, My, you, you, must, yeah. you must have copped some flack from that. For that. Oh, a lot. Yeah, I, I I get flack all the time. I just got a tweet from somebody that said that that uh, that was my phone. That's okay. <laughs> I, I I 
I just is, got a, yeah. I just got a tweet from somebody who said that I'm filled with uh, self loathing and oh, hate and, myself. As anyone who's met you clearly realizes, what a load <laughs> of junk! It is ridiculous, but you know, he, here's here's the thing. The reason I wrote that is on my love for the church, and the church itself has recognized that the priesthood is not a right. The priesthood is is a vocation that's called by God. And we need really good men to stand in the place of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I believe now that God looks at me and, and, and says, Dan, I'm, I'm glad that you've come home. And I'm, I'm pleased that you've, you've fallen the church, fallen the church's teaching, and you, you are, you are uh, doing work for the kingdom. And he would say, I, here's my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. I hope that's what he can say to me. But that doesn't mean that I'd be a man who is suitable to be a priest. What's, and for that's, those, for those, our listeners who aren't aware, what's the church's official teaching on this? Well, the history on this goes all the way back to specifically 1961. The Vatican issued an instruction on, on the priesthood. And one of the things in that instruction, it said, men with a homosexual inclination— should not be admitted to the seminaries. Uh, It also said this, which is interesting based on the scandals that we've heard erupting of homosexual scandals in the Honduran uh, seminary, Chilean seminaries. It said if any seminarian is found to have um, violated gravely the the Sixth Commandment with uh, a member of the same sex or opposite sex, they need to be expelled from the seminary immediately. So that's 1961. And then uh, in in 2005, and we have to think about the context of this, um, Pope Benedict between, became pope after the sex abuse scandal in 2002 erupted. Right. He, he became pope in 2005. What was one of the first things he did? He issued a document on homosexuality and the priesthood in the fall of 2005. And in it he said uh, that— Though the church respects those who have homosexual inclinations, uh, those who have a deep-seated homosexual tendency should not be allowed to, to be priests. Now, it made, it, it made a distinction between uh, deep-seated and transitory, and we can talk about that in a moment because it's not really clear what that means. Uh, but it made it very clear that People with these deep-seated tendencies should not become priests. Uh, Fast forward to 2016, when Pope Francis spoke about the topic, he reiterated the 2005 document and said again that those with men with deep-seated homosexual tendencies shouldn't be admitted to the seminary. When I was in Italy uh, earlier this spring, he met with the Italian bishops, and he said about homosexual seminarians, he said— If there is any doubt, they should not be admitted to the seminary. So the teaching of the church has been constant, uh, clearly specified since 1961, but I think in practice it was happening before that. So it sounds like – now, I have my thoughts, but here, let me just throw this out. Someone will say – it sounds like the church is picking on homosexuals. Why shouldn't the church just say something like people who have deep-seated tendencies to unchastity ought not to be admitted into the priesthood? Well, that's that's a good question. Uh, and clearly somebody uh, who is living with uh, severe temptations to unchastity shouldn't be a priest. But there's something specific the church recognizes about homosexuality, that it's a wound in our sexual identity. Um this is this is a question of of what kind how do I view myself as a man? A priest is clearly got to be a man who models Christ. Nobody can do it perfectly, of course. We recognize that, uh, but we are called to be uh, as a priest a man who knows what it means to be a father, and this this uh, demands a certain maturity. The church speaks about this in these uh, documents on homosexuality and the priesthood. They speak of effective maturity. And what this effective maturity means is that a man can relate to other people in a way that is in accordance with uh, our true nature as sexual creatures. And what I mean by this is that a man 
sees a woman as his complement. And, and that, that, that God's vision for human sexuality is a great gift. It is good uh, that a priest recognizes his attraction to women and then gives that up for the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, celibacy for the kingdom is the denial of a good vocation, and the good vocation is marriage and thus being a father. The same sort of man who would be a good father and a good husband because he knows what it means to be a man and to lay down his life uh, for his potential wife, like Christ laid down his life for the church, that's the sort of man we need in the priesthood. Now, if a man is confused about his sexual identity and sees men, not women, as as somehow his complement, there's something amiss in his sexuality. And it and, impedes his ability to be a spiritual father. And, of course, like uh, homosexual tendencies are a I want to say this delicately because the last thing I want to do is get emotional and say things hyperbolically that I don't mean. But I do think that this is accurate, that homosexual tendencies are a greater perversion than, say, a desire for uh, fornication or something like that. And I think as Catholics, what we've That's done true. to try to placate the culture, you know, when we say, yes, yes, we think homosexuality is a sin, but we also think fornication is a sin. We also think contraception is a sin. It's like, yeah, yeah, but there are degrees of per- perversity here. And and clearly, a married couple contracepting is not the same as a man sodomizing another man. Yeah, that's true. And, Push and back on any of this if you think I'm so overstating it. No, 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 no. I, 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 um, see, here's the thing is anybody listening into this uh, from the, the gay rights movement or whatever say, oh, for, for Dan to agree with what Matt just said, oh, he's such an inner, he's got inner homophobia. No, uh, one, of, one of the truths that I love about the church is it has told me what is good, true, and beautiful about human sexuality. It, the church uses the phrase, and it falls hard on the ear, that homosexuality is objectively disordered. And people want to jump on that and say, wow, that's so cruel. No, those are words of love Mm -hmm. and protection. Uh, Where would you you be right now if all the good Catholics in your life didn't speak truth to you about this homosexual issue? Oh, I, I, Do you know what I mean? If they they did the Father Martin line where, well, let's just sort of be as vague as possible without fully saying that, that homosexual acts are virtuous or can be virtuous. Well, quite honestly, I might have been dead because uh, I the, the truth is, is when when I kind of came of into sexual maturity, it was at the highlights of, of uh, the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And and uh, it was really the fear of God and the fear of AIDS that delayed my entrance into the gay world. And it was finally uh, basically anger at God and rebellion that I, I pushed through that when I was 32 and I plucked the forbidden fruit and, uh, it was not, (laughs) I was happy as the prodigal son is happy when he leaves home at first, but then he wakes up and says, what was I thinking? But I think to, I think to myself, if I had been told that this was good, beautiful, normal, I might be dead. Hmm. And I do not say that with any exaggeration. Yeah. God says no to us because he loves us. Hmm. So, okay, point blank. Is there a homosexual problem in the priesthood? As evidenced by the the continuing scandals that we see break forth in the church, absolutely yes. How dare you, sir? Uh, (laughs) why, Why not say that there is an unchastity problem? Why not just say, like, you know, men are kind of going off with women or maybe, you know, uh, having sex with kids, that's not a homosexual problem. That's uh, either an unchastity problem or that's a uh, pedophilia problem. It's a pedophilia problem. That's the problem. It's not a homosexual problem. You know, that is, it's remarkable that John Jay's report that was uh, commissioned by the USCCB, the, the Conference of Bishops, um, had conflicting Information. It's it, it. It made this statement. It said, based on the the evidence of abuse that it studied from 1950 to 2002, uh, you could only consider five percent of the abuse to be true pedophilia. Um, when they looked at the analysis, 81 percent of the victims were male. 
Now, of those, 95% of them w- would not fall under the category of pedophilia. We, we would, we, they, these are post-pubescent, post-pubescent boys that have reached sexual maturity, even right. though they're, they're minors. Um, but that is that is uh, what is technically called a phoebophilia, phoebophilia, yeah, which is a form of homosexuality, right? And and so the the, the John Jay report lockstep with uh, the the cultural tide in in in, in the two thousands said, of course, this isn't a homosexual problem, yet their own data undermines their assertion. Do you think this is why, like, the secular media hasn't gone? Guns out on uh, Bishop Mac- on uh, Cardinal McCarrick. Well, it, it's it's uh, because the I, the only, yes. you correct me, but I think the only um, thing he was accused of uh, with a minor was it was one accusation with a sixteen year old boy. Is that correct? I might have. Yeah, I, I heard later that there might have been a, a, a second uh, adolescent victim, but they were adolescents. And uh, so, like, if you're an older man having sex with a sixteen year old boy, you're a disgusting person, but you're also not a pedophile. Like, just because he's said to be a child by the law, that's clearly a man having sex with a young man. Well, and if you look at you look at uh, it's bizarre how how we can look at. Uh, Ages of sexual consent. Many states at sixteen. I think that's horrific. But uh, the, the the notion is is that if as somebody who's at sixteen, they're not a child anymore physically. My, under- my understanding is because the church is universal and has to take into account all the different cultures within the world. That uh, canon law states that a woman must be fourteen and a man sixteen. I'm not sure if that's been amended amended at all since. But that was. Last, what I looked mm. at, that's what it said. I mean, you, you, so that would be clearly very inappropriate in our culture, but you know, yeah. maybe in others and throughout the history it wouldn't have been. But, but yeah, you're clearly a man yeah, or a young and, man. And, and, and so uh, it, it, let's take McCarrick again. Uh, most of his abuse of his office was with seminarians. Uh, and and that was clearly with adults. That's clearly homosexuality. But your, uh, to your point about the, the media, uh, the media would want to celebrate uh, Theodore McCarrick being honest about himself and being gay and exploring his sexuality. They would love it if 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 the Catholic Church would say, "Yes, embrace." who you feel yourself to be, be gay, and priests should be uh, expressive of their sexuality too. So it does. It goes against their trope to say that there's anything at all about this right. scandal that's homosexual. That's scandalous. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, and do you think that there's, I think there's, it's clearly there's certain, men, perhaps many members in the clergy who are hoping that that'll also happen. I think it seems obvious that Father, what's his face? Um, mm. <laughs> building a bridge guy uh, yeah. would be one of them, and others. Like from an outside perspective, it seems like that there are particular clergy who th- who are biding their time in hopes that Pope Francis will make an amendment to the Church's teaching on homosexual acts. Well, in the one of the things that I write about in my first things article uh, is the problem of homosexual clergy who either uh, overtly or covertly are undermining the Church's teaching. For example, soon after I came back to the church in 2009, I screwed up. I, I, I hooked up with a guy. I knew it was sin. I had this addictive quality that, that, was, that was driving me, and I was filled with remorse. I went to the next confession that I knew I could, mm-hmm. and it was a stranger pr- priest to me. I didn't know him. I'd never met him before. And he told me, that's not a sin. Oh, God. He said, go find a boyfriend. The church is going to change. God have mercy. Yeah, he, he, he recently, uh, what's his face, Father Martin, recently mm-hmm. said something to the effect of if you were to get rid of priests within the clergy, you would empty the dioceses and um, religious orders of like 50% of their priests. Yeah. It if, would if seem you, that he's in a place to know that too. Well, I, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the question of, of how many priests there are who are – who who – live with same-sex attraction, I'm sure it's much higher than the average population, but I doubt it's Why is that? Tell me why that is. Well, uh, Richard Seip, who studied this, he was, uh, he was, did heroic work with 
the sex abuse scandal. And he was a psychologist. He was actually a priest himself, but he left the priesthood, got laicized so he could marry a woman. But he studied this, and he, he wrote in one of his books – on the subject, he said, the priesthood is fast turning into a, a gay profession. And one of the, one of the reasons that, that he lists there is some people ran to the church uh, to, to squelch the question of, why aren't you dating? Why aren't you getting married? And it seemed a vocation for some people. Uh, that they went into the into uh, the priesthood. I think also there was uh, probably some active recruiting. I, I you know you hear these stories of of people who went to the seminary in uh, say the sixties and seventies because they wanted to become a priest, and then they were they were put off by the the clear homosexual culture that was there. Uh, and, and so I, I think there is a, a a concerted effort to kind of create this uh, homosexual boys club, and it succeeded. And what, do you, what do you say to those Catholics who are offended that we would even have an episode like this on Pines with Aquinas? Like, how dare you? You know, how dare you single out homosexual people? Are you saying that homosexual people are more likely to, like, molest children? Like, if that were true, what do you say about my aunt who's, you know, happily married to some other woman? You're saying she's more likely to do this? I mean, this is despicable. Just just attack unchastity. Don't single out homosexuals. Well... All we're looking at is the statistics, the data, the, the data, uh, and and the honest truth is the other sad fact. One of the reasons why the church needs to proclaim its uh, good news concerning homosexuality is the remarkable amount of promiscuity that exists in in the gay community. Here, I got a bet. Uh, I got let's do a bet right now. I'm gonna make a bet. I've never been on a men seeking men site or a women seeking women site. All right. But mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, where is this going? Uh, yeah. I, I would put money, okay, that if I was right now to go to a men seeking men site, all the talk would be about sexual hookups. If I went to the women seeking women site, it would perhaps some of that be that, but most of it would be more about companionship and and friendship. Am I right yeah. or wrong? Well, uh, all we all you have to look at is is once again the data. Uh, so he, here's a remarkable statistic. There was a study done uh, in the late 90s in Australia of 2,800 or so, I think uh, around 2,800 uh, self-identified gay men, 49 and over. And one of the things they asked was, how many uh, sexual partners have you had in your life? And the modal range, the most common answer for, for those people, those 2,800 people, was between 100 and 500 sexual partners. 15.7% of those people said they had had over 1,000 sexual partners. Oh. It's, it's bad. Now, I, I think, like, any man listening to this gets this. Like, I know that women can have strong sex drives, but I think, by and large, men have stronger sex drives than women. And I think if you were to ask the typical husband, if you were to have sex whenever you wanted to have sex, like, how, how, how much more would you be having sex? The answer would be, a lot more. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's almost well, like... Well, that's the argument. The argument is, well, men just, men just like to have more sex. But think about it. A thousand sexual partners. You know, when when I was growing up, when we and the teenage boys would have Bible class, and we we read about um, uh, King Solomon's thousand concubines. Right. Yeah. Seven hundred so, wives, three hundred concubines. Yeah. It's a, you know it's, you know I remember the 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 boys in Bible class were saying you could sleep with a different woman every night for three years, you know. But who really wants that? You know, e even even the wildest dreams of 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 a of a man with a normal sex drive would say, I no, I don't really want to have a thousand sexual partners. I don't want to have five hundred uh, sexual partners. The idea, you know, I don't know. I think I disagree. I think a lot of men, if if they weren't afraid to be judged or. Let's say you weren't talking to a Catholic who was afraid that this was wrong. I think they would say, "Yeah, they would totally want that." Isn't that what porn is? It's just not all the way. Well, I, I get. I mean, on a certain level, yes. But uh, I, I, for, for me, the, the experience that I've had in the homosexual community is 
there's a remarkable drive to fill a void. Well, and then as you say, look at the data because that's all you would have to do, right? You would. Ha- I mean, it's yeah. not. It's not like we're we're judging gay men with a man who's married. We're saying yeah, there's a lot of men who aren't married and live promiscuous lives. Are they? Are they? Are they saying a thousand women within that time frame? Yeah, it, it just – and then people say, oh, well, that's just because it's not available. Of course, you have two men who might be interested in each other right. uh, going together. They're, they're going to have a lot more sex. But you know, I think about my friend Paul who uh, is in Desire of the Everlasting Hills. Love that and man. Love that man. Good, remarkable story of God's miraculous intervention in his life. And he had – Thousands of sexual partners, but one of the one of the remarkable lines in his uh, in his stories, he says, "I kept looking for another man who would complete the 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 lack of my own manhood, that would somehow complete me." And so there becomes this this uh, drive. If I could just be with the perfect man, I'm going to finally feel like a man, and that's what is driving. Uh, this promiscuous unchastity um, among men. And it's happening, uh, of course, with – you don't just – you take a vow of celibacy to become a priest. If you don't have these things sorted out, and this applies to both if you're attracted to men or women, if you don't have your – if you do not have uh, the the kind of maturity that recognizes that chastity is a good gift for you – um, you're not going to be able to fulfill your your, your uh, priestly obligations, and the data just shows that men with same sex attraction have a really difficult time with chastity. And I, and I, I quote uh, Doctor uh, Father George Lloyd with a PhD uh, from New York University. He worked with uh, homosexual men and homosexual priests, and he says the data is just clear on this question: the psychic energy for a man with homosexual tendencies to remain chaste is much greater than a man with opposite sex attraction. Okay. So, okay. So someone might listen to this and say, okay, 80%, uh, these different studies have shown were boys that priests preyed upon. And maybe the majority of them were, you know, post pubescent. Okay. So fine. But are you saying, and I think this is what's going to stick in a lot of people's craw, that people who uh, are homosexual or have same-sex attraction are more likely to prey upon children. No, I, I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, That's what it ne- sounds like when you say that this to some people. It sounds like that to them. You say this is a homosexual problem. Therefore, what you're saying is people with same-sex attraction are more likely to abuse kids. Well, that's that's not uh, what we're talking about. Is a specific category of of men in the priesthood. And the question is, should we continue to ordain men with deep-seated homosexual tendencies if the evidence clearly points that as far as the Catholic Church sex abuse scandals happen, it's overwhelmingly uh, an issue of homosexual priests? Right. Uh, I mean, that's really the question here, because um, uh, I—, I, I the the tendency uh, to to you, you're putting you're putting these priests with adolescent boys uh, who are altar boys and it, it just is not wise and the evidence shows that the risk is too great and I think the answer to part of the problems is to abide by the church's teaching that has existed since 1961. What would it be like being a, you know, having same-sex attraction and going to seminary? Like, would that be like me, you know, going into a convent? You know, it's just like living with a bunch of single women. Is it like that or not really? Because I can well, see how that would clearly be a temptation for sin and therefore wouldn't be good. Is that the kind of argument or not really? Well, the, and here we, we, we maybe want to talk about um, the, the Vatican's discussion of transitory homosexuality, homosexual tendencies. I think for some, the evidence is clear that there have been plenty of good priests with homosexual tendencies who have kept their vows, who have gone through seminary, 
and have uh, have been good priests. Um, I know some of them, mm. and so so you're uh, not saying if you're a priest with same sex attraction, you should leave the priesthood somehow. Absolutely not, because I, you know the grace of ordination is there to fulfill the office if we cooperate with it. Um, so what's the, the what's the difference between deep seated and then transitory? Well, and so this is this is a interesting. A distinction that the catechism made, but it didn't really um, describe it, except to say that it might have been uh, uh, maybe an adolescent experience. Uh, it's a, it's a fairly common occurrence that that uh, when you're growing up, you might experiment with another boy. You might have these attractions, right? Um, and, and and so uh, the uh, I remember having stuff like that. Like I remember having like like thinking about a guy who was a couple years above me in high school, who all the girls adored, who was very handsome, and like having these accidental images of him in a sexual position and wondering what the heck was happening to me. Now, if that's I was fairly normal, right? And if I, I think it was if, if I was in today's age, I'm like, oh, I, just, I guess I'm gay. So I'm gay, as opposed to no, maybe you just like see something in this guy that you deeply respect and admire, and traits which you would like to emulate. You know, well, a- a- exactly. So this is what the church is talking about. That you know, if these are for the most part transitory, and so let's say a man like that going into the seminary. And he might find some of the men attractive, but he recognizes that he sees what's going on and say, hey, what, where is this coming from? Um, is there something about him that I admire that that somehow uh, I wish was a trait for myself and, and they can respond to it in a mature way and with counseling and they can work through that? Um, I, I think that uh, throwing a man like that into um, the seminary m- might might be a challenge, but they can overcome it if if they are growing in their own sense of their masculinity and recognize this is a dead end and these are not desires that I should pursue at all. But I think uh, for, for for a man who is solely attracted to men, it's a mistake to to bring them into the seminary. Uh, I, I don't think you can say it's the same as a man going into a convent because the sexual uh, experience is, is different, but right. the the the, the, uh, um, the temptations there and 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 t- this, you're in a place where you're trying to bond with other men. You're, right. you're, 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 and if you're not, uh, one of the things I write about in my book is is I had to learn and grow in friendship. What does friendship between two men really look like? Mm. Now. I, and I did not know what that was like when I was in my 20s or my 30s. I think now, as I'm almost 50, I, I, I've found a lot of healing in that, uh, where where it doesn't become this sort of, uh, you know, I would think about my male friends and I'd worry, well, what did he just say? Why did he say? Why did he look at me that way? Yeah. No, guys don't do that. <laughs> that's, that's not that's not a that's not a normal. Uh, relationship unless they're that, unless they're in a uh, Dostoevsky novel, where right, I, don't it, sh- <laughs> I just got done reading the Brothers Karamazov. It's incredibly psychological. Everyone's neurotic. Continue. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, it, 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 uh, you know the the problem is is if you have somebody else with these same temptations there, and you sense that, and then uh, it's so easy to fall in on chastity. A friend of mine who just got ordained about three years ago. He was at seminary, uh, you know, less than five years ago. He went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and four of the seminaries on pilgrimage in Jerusalem went to a gay bar. Like, oh, God, what have... Say... Oh. What in the world are you are you are you doing? So it's I'll not say, it's not just that there's homosexuals in the priesthood with a, some of them or perhaps a large number who have no intention of remaining chaste, although I'm sure many do. It's also this like in-house weird boys club where people kind of get promoted and isn't it? Yeah. Well, there has been that. I mean, people uh people have talked about the the uh 
the homosexual subculture where they where they support each other and and it becomes sort of hey i know about your scandalous behavior you know about mine let's let's watch each other's back that clearly has happened we wish this wasn't true but no, we can't we don't want keep ignoring true. this thing. I, I I tweeted out the other day. It's times like these we wish we could keep calling Michael Voris hyperbolic, but alas. <laughs> What's your opinion on Michael Voris and Church Militant? Well, I I I, I don't have I don't have an opinion. <laughs> no, no. I think I think uh, uh, I I just wish uh, there's a certain uh, bravado and uh, and. You know, in your face quality that I don't think is always Christ-like. Right. That's just my honest truth. But I, I you know, I, I, I can't imagine Jesus speaking the way sometimes I hear Michael Boris speaking. Right. Someone said to me recently, like, who's he trying to convert? And I thought to myself, well, that's a good point. I can't see any non-Catholic converting, but maybe he's like trying to wake up like a sleeping uh, Catholics who just don't want to face this issue. And and don't and don't want to recognize the church's teaching on this issue, but yeah, okay. Well, so bo- well, both is needed, right? It's, it's is, a but, message in the way it's presented. It's it's not but, enough just to speak the truth. The more valuable uh, message are people who are who have been in the Vatican and see it, and they speak about it like Archbishop Fagano. I mean, he he's very clear that there is a homosexual priest problem in in the church, and he calls it out, and and I think. Uh, thank God for His courage on that. So, what do we what do we do from? Uh, gosh, there's so much to say. What do what do we what do we do from from here? What, what do we as lay Catholics do? I mean, I I don't think I've prayed for a pope as much as I pray for Pope Francis. Um, if what uh, Vigano has said is true, do you think Pope Francis should resign? That is. Above my pay grade. I'm going to say I, yes. Well, like I, I, I uh, what I want to see is I want to see uh, some examination of of this these accusations, and I want to see if this is the case. I want to see cardinals mm-hmm. there in the place to really uh, keep the pope accountable. Uh, now he may have ignore them like he has with with other questions, but. Um, if if he knew about this, and if he wants to be true to his own words, uh, then he would naturally resign if he's going to be consistent with that. But uh, if these are true, it's it's these accusations are just damning. Yeah, Philip uh, Lawler just published an article with First Things Today called "What Francis Knew." Um, and he closes his article by saying, the questions raised by Vigano cannot be unasked. They can only be answered or ignored. To answer them will entail painful process, a painful process, quite possibly leading to a purge of the Catholic hierarchy, but to ignore them would require another cover-up. That could be fatal to this papacy. What do you say to priests who are maybe listening to this who do have same-sex attraction? And, and they feel like, oh, gosh. I mean, there's got to be faithful priests out there who love Jesus Christ, love the church, love that the church speaks truth about homosexual acts, and uh, but have same-sex attraction. It must be a very lonely time for them right now. Well, I, and this is why I, I, I wrote in my article with First Things, I said I broached this with a lot of trepidation uh, because – I really do think that despite this being a homosexual clergy problem that has brought about this scandal, I do think and I want to believe that uh, m- most of them have been true to their vows. And and uh, it's a <laughs> I don't know. What's your, I, want, what, I mean, your brother doesn't have same-sex attraction, but what did he, as, no. a, as a priest, what has he shared with you about what it's like being a priest right now? Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult for him, but, but uh, my, my brother is um, also it, it's just optimistic about what the Holy Spirit is doing right now. So he's excited to be a priest. It's, it's, Good man. He, he, he's he's uh, frustrated. He's angry. 
at, at the at the cover ups and 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 spineless <laughs> uh, people in the hierarchy, but he's also inspired by the ones who have shown a backbone, yeah. who have who have been courageous, and he is taking even more seriously his own commitment to holiness and to help his own parish uh, follow follow Christ in the midst of this. And he's encouraging them, stay with the church and let's wait and see what the Holy Spirit's doing. So I, I think that that's got to be the key for, for priests is to get excited to say, look, there's the whole history of the church has been up and down. Right, there's yeah. been moments there's of never, There has never been a what do you say, picturesque, idealistic time in the church, ever, 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 from the get-go. There's always been oh. schisms and heresy. and I, I was actually, uh, I spoke at the Courage Conference uh, with, with you. Two years ago, yeah, it was yeah, great. And I was driving back to the airport with Father Paul. Yes. Uh, Father Paul... Um, Father Paul Czech. Paul yeah, Czech. Father Paul Czech. And I said to him, do you ever remember a time when the church has been this divided? And he went, uh, the Arian heresy? He went, okay, touche. <laughs> Where the majority of Catholic bishops were heretics. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we forget our own history. Uh, and and you know, there, was, there was a period of time where the, the papacy was just rocked with scandal. They, they called it the, uh, the pornocracy. Yes. You've got you one know, one pope what digging up the dead body of another to put oh, him on trial. Exactly. I mean, one they, of them they, they, sold the papacy and then got it back later. Selling the papal cutlery, having you know, writing. Oh into, yeah, and yeah. Mistresses in the Vatican, you know. So th- there is a long history of of sexual scandals in the church, and we have to cling to the promises. Of, of God, Amen. The gates, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And and and, P- and Peter's words: wh- wh- Where will I go? Like, where else shall I go? Yeah. And that's like an honest question because I understand that Catholics right now, now might be like, "Look, I, I'm done. Like, let me look at Eastern Orthodoxy or something. Like, I, I, I I'm, I'm done. You know." Um, but, and then some of them want to just leave the church altogether. And you think, yeah, but what are where you, you going to go? Where are you going to go? Because if you find a church that's perfect, as soon as you enter it, it will be wretched because you are. You know what I mean? Like it'll be, <laughs> right, there'll right. be a big blot on it. It, it, it. There's that line that's maybe too much of a cliche at this point, but you you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. You, you don't leave Peter because of Judas, and you don't even leave Peter because of Peter. Right. Well, that's uh, G.K. Chesterton. You know, he said, he said, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and and Christ built the church on Peter, a weak man, and so it's evidence that that this church of failed, broken people is kept together by the grace of Jesus Christ, and that's what we cling to. We cling to Christ and His promises and the Eucharist. He's there, despite. Bad priests, but the vast majority of priests are great. And I'm so excited about the newer, younger generation of priests that are coming in. Uh, and, and the seminaries have been cleaned up the, 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 for the most part, despite that story I told you about Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. I, I'm talking to younger priests and say, we did not have this experience in our seminary. Mm-hmm. My brother did when he was in the seminary 15, 20 years ago. And there are still some seminaries where it's happening, and we need to clean that up. But I think we are seeing a time where Christ is coming in. I'm going to clean the church, and Mary is 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 sweeping, like I said. I like it. You know, but I, I do want to say, I this whole topic of homosexuality in the priesthood, I the men, the priests I know who have lived with this with same sex attraction and are good and holy men. Uh, they should hold their head high because their virtue is sanctifying other people. They, their, their commitment to the truth and to chastity uh, is doing great things for the kingdom of God. And so because, even though my suggestion is that the church follow its own teaching and not ordain anyone anymore with deep-seated homosexual tendencies— I know many good and holy priests who have lived out the virtues heroically, heroically, and their reward in heaven is going to be great. And and so 
I, I, I cannot leave the podcast without talking about that and to, to spur them on in the good work that they're doing and not let the evil actions of, of men who that have given into their baser uh, temptations to discourage them, but rather for th- to cause them to turn to cling to the grace of Jesus Christ and to be the good spiritual fathers that God gave them the grace and ordination to be despite any weaknesses they might have. Amen. Thank you for saying that. You know, to quote Father Mike Schmitz, you know, when when there's scandal in the church, you don't leave, you lead. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and you know, like, that means more than just criticizing others. Criticizing others is absolutely necessary, especially if others have committed heinous crimes. But I'm, I'm thinking somewhere, I think it's the second chapter of Romans or third thereabouts where it says, you know, Paul's like, you know, you who, who judge those of, who commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You know, those of you who do this, do you do this? And I think, you know, the same thing we could all say to ourselves. It's like you and, 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 and like there is this, you know, for, for most of us, I don't think, well, for many of us, we're not committing as grievous a crimes as some of these, these bishops and priests that did, which was just disgusting. And if, what is it, what's it called? The, the Pennsylvania Report? The Grand Jury Report. It's just, I, I wept. It's so I read disgusting. It and I wept. I, I don't. I, I wish I had never read it, but at the same time, I'm glad it came out. It was both, you know. Yeah, I, I yeah. hear you. I wept too. I, I was so angry. Yeah, it was. Just, it was just. It was just the, the, these these men who 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 were supposed to be loving fathers to these people just right. were predators, were demons. Predators. But yeah. you know, but but so we should judge them, and we in that sense, those acts ought to be judged, and they ought to be publicly shamed. All that's true, and yet. I, I can't he- think Paul saying you who judge these sexual perverts are you a sexual pervert? Like, do you look at pornography? You know, are you doing everything within your power, Matt Frad, to live an upright and virtuous life, to follow Christ, to be committed to prayer? And the answer for most of us is uh, not really. It's like, all right, no. well, get your bloody house in order. You know, <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and you know, uh, one of the reasons. Um, I have been called to speak about this topic is because of my own uh, sinful tendencies. You know, <laughs> like I, I've recognized that uh, thanks be to God. I mean, I, I, there's no way I can ever uh, somebody say, oh, great, your book was translated in Italian and it's fantastic. You have said that us in the podcast. Well, the reason I wrote a book is because I was a prodigal son. And of course, we continue to be the prodigal son until yeah. we die. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the temptations of the world are still there, and we need Jesus. The, the the most important lesson I've learned is that Jesus Himself is the holiness in me. Uh, and 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 the honest truth is, that we how, how are we gonna how are we gonna live out the call of Jesus Christ? By always going to the well, going to, to, to the Eucharist, taking advantage of the sacraments, living out the spiritual disciplines and recognizing, but by the grace of God go I. And all of us have a past. Uh, we all know we need Jesus. We all know we're broken. Um, and, and one of the things that I admire about the saints so much, they've got no, they, they, the closer you get to God, the more you realize how far away you are, yeah. how far you fall short. Um, so yes, we need to, we need to be very clear in denouncing these sins, but we've got to look at the log in our own eye. If there's one yeah. and recognize by the grace of God, go I and then, and pray for change, but pray for mercy for those, those priests. One of the saddest stories I've ever heard, uh, out from 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 the sex abuse scandals, which is aside from uh, the 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 uh, the horrible uh, wounds of abuse, is a, a psychologist who works with priests in dioceses. She works an unenviable job. She works with priests who have been removed because of uh, sex abuse scandals. Oh my gosh! God bless her. God bless her. And she told me. She, one of these priests who uh, was laicized, she right after the, the hearing, saw him weeping. 
And she said, what's going on? What, what are you thinking about right now? And he looked up at her with tears coming down his eyes. He says, you know, I wanted to be a good priest. Mm, bless her. You know, so you sit there and you think, uh, there, that's where the mercy of Jesus Christ comes looking on that, that poor soul. Yeah. And, and says, uh, you, you have done what I warned you against. Uh, let someone damage one of these children. It better that there's a millstone around your neck. He did it and he acknowledged it. But I think that's a man who is going, he's not sorrowful just that he got caught. Right. And that's the key for him. And in his life of penance, he can do a lot of good for the church now. Yeah. Yeah, amen. This is something that I don't think many of us believe. I feel like for the last couple of weeks, I have been frantically, well, not a couple of weeks, last few days, frantically refreshing my news feed frantically you know what's going on what's going on as if as if my knowledge of these things is going to control it you know and every time i talk with my friends i uh, too often i say what's going to happen what's going to happen as opposed to like lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on the church have Mm -hmm. mercy on pope francis Mm -hmm. have mercy on the cardinals come and restore your church you know pull out the weeds resurrect your bride Right, heal, and heal the wound. Heal, face. heal the wound, and and bring on the scalpel. Yeah, bring on the scalpel. Bring the light. Let's get. Let's cauterize it all this time. Do you think that um, we Catholic? I I feel a lot more open this time around than last time. I have to be honest. The first time this all came out, the sex abuse scandal, you know, years and years ago now, I got defensive. You know, a little bit. Like, I wasn't justifying these awful things that people are done, but I thought, oh, people are attacking the church, you know. And th- there is this sort of idea of we want to circle the wagons when we feel our particular group is being attacked. But this time round, I thought, oh, Lord, yeah, let, let, let's shine the lights on and let the cockroaches scurry away. Like, I, I, I want this investigation that happened in Pennsylvania, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I want that in all 50 states. I do too. I want it I want it all out so we can deal with it. Um, you know, I wasn't in the church in 2000, 2002. That's that's when I was uh, a prodigal son, you know. So I came in in 2009 and I remember hearing about this and but it wasn't on my radar, but but I I am hearing what you're saying uh, that people are we've been through this not again and and we will not tolerate this anymore. And I think that that's a message that the hierarchy needs to hear. And I, and I hope to God they're hearing it. Yeah. I am uh, so grateful for you that you exist and that you write on these things. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to have to have to have that beer sometime together. Hang I, I would enjoy that immensely. And uh, we'll get good. My brother there and we'll, we'll have a good time, but, and hopefully uh, chatting about some happier topics. Yeah. And, and that's, I do think, I do think we are turning a corner here. It's going to be difficult for a while, but Christ is renewing and purifying his bride. Mm -hmm. We'll raise a glass to that. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Dan. God bless you. God bless you. Thanks so much uh, to everyone who listened to the show. I hope that it was illuminating, but I also hope that it was, it was hopeful. Um, And I want to thank you for listening. I know for a fact, because this has happened every time we've addressed homosexuality in the past, uh, that several patrons drop out and get really angry and uh, tell me that I shouldn't be addressing this. And I just have to say that I think one of the great blessings of this day and age is that individual Catholics who have somewhat of a voice within the church uh, aren't necessarily or don't have to be bound to a particular group or even dioceses that might tell them to say things in a certain way. What's wonderful about Patreon is that I get to interview whoever I want, and I get to say what I what seems true to me, and you can listen or not listen, and you can support and not or not support. But I don't have some massive staff uh, that you need to cover, uh, and so that's why I think Patreon's so terrific. So if you've listened to the show and you no longer want to support me, that's fine. 
Again, that's one of the beautiful things about Patreon. If 20 of you get upset, it's all right, because the beautiful thing about Patreon is many people give at a, at a small level. But if you like this show, if you want to support it, if you believe in this sort of independent sort of Catholic commentary, please start supporting me. Uh, go to pintswithaquinas.com and click donate uh, or patreon.com slash mattfrad. If you give 10 bucks a month, I give you a free book and a bunch of other stuff. Free audio content, free videos. I give you 20, if you give 20 bucks, I give you a free Pines with Aquinas beer stein. There's so much I give you in return. I can't go over it all right here, but just kind of want to pique your interest. Please go check that out because uh, I have some pretty cool things in the works, like long sit-down video chats that I'm already in the works planning. I'm not going to say who, but Christopher West just agreed to be on the video. So, you know, this stuff costs a lot of money and uh, Patreon supporters make this podcast and these upcoming videos happen. Big thanks to all of you. God bless. And God bless the church. Mm-hmm.